Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Xingyi Ling received her PhD in chemistry from the University of Twente, the Netherlands in 2009. She then conducted postdoctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley between 2009 to 2011 under the Rubicon Fellowship from the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. Xingyi joined the chemistry and biological chemistry division at Nanyang Technological University in 2011, where she was promoted to associate professor in 2016. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Asian Rising Star Lectureship, Asian Chemical Congress, Lectureship Awardee at the Chemical Society of Japan Annual Meeting, L'Oreal Singapore for Women in Science National Fellowship, the Asian and Ocean uh, Photochemistry Association Prize for Young Scientists, the Singapore National Research Foundation Fellowship, the Rubicon Fellowship by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, and the IUPAC Young Chemistry Award. Her research focuses on nanoparticle synthesis, surface chemistry, self-assembly, nanopatterning, nanofabrication, and metals and materials characterization. In particular, her group uses molecule-specific surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy for fundamental studies and applications in catalysis, sensing, and diagnosis. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jing Ling. Thank you, Terry, for the introduction. Uh, now I'm going to share my slides. All right. Uh, first of all, really thank uh, Terry for the invitation. It's been a long time that we meet in person and hopefully uh, the pandemic will be over soon and then we can meet again and interact. You know, we miss uh, those good, good old time, but uh, well, under the current circumstances, we can only meet virtually. So today is really our my honor to present our group's work uh, in using SIRS for metabolomics. In particular, uh, today the story will be about how we can use SIRS sensing platform for multiplex identification and quantification of urine metabolites for uh, miscarriage uh, related uh, um, detection. Okay, so um, I know this, I'm the first one, so I'm going to very briefly go through. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you can, right? Okay, okay. Right. Um, so, um, yeah. So let me give a very brief introduction on the uh, plasmonics. So basically, um, uh, metallic nanoparticles are able to interact with light um, and give rise to a phenomenon called localized surface plasmon resonance. And um, despite uh, the nanoparticles of uh, few orders of magnitude smaller than the wavelength of light, it is able to squeeze light in a nanometer volume and resulting in a very strong electromagnetic field. Such kind of light matter interaction can be manipulated and give rise to a very interesting optical properties. And you can manipulate such LSPR uh, uh, by changing the shape of the nanostructures, the size, the dielectric environment, and also its uh, spatial arrangement. And the electromagnetic field of uh, the nanoparticle generated by the nanoparticles upon light matter interaction can further be used to enhance the Raman scattering of the molecules when, they are in, when the molecules are in close proximity. So if you put molecules close to the surface, you will then enhance the Raman scattering of this molecule with the possibility of enhancement up to 10 to the power of 12. So this is when single molecule detection is possible. And so far the report uh, and the literature show that uh, such kind of low, uh, single molecule detection is, uh, at, uh, is observed at the localized hotspot uh, region. So very obviously hotspot engineering is the main contributor towards SIRS signals enhancement. So despite such promising properties, SIRS is still not fully and uh, not yet fully embraced by the commercial world, certainly not as commercial as other analytical tools such as fluorescence, such as mass spec, LC and GC. My, uh, my take is that uh, the detection sensitivity and specificity of uh, SIRS remains a challenge because as you understand, SIRS is a surface sensitive technique. Molecule must come close to the surface in order to experience this enhanced in the signal enhance in the aroma signal. So if a molecule has no affinity to the plasmodic surface, 
it will be very challenging to detect this molecule. So, so my opinion is that in addition to the hotspot engineering, we should venture beyond that. And to add on, we should further uh, manipulate the analyte through various strategies. So currently there are a few uh, strategies that you can make use to uh, bring the, bring the uh, molecules close to the surface. So I divide them into using chemical method to really capture or direct analyte close to the metallic surface, or you can render the, the surface more hydrophilic or oleophobic so that you can physically confine the analyte close to the surface. Or you can chemically change the, the molecular Raman cross-section of the analyte and further to enhance the Raman signal. So for, for our group, we make use of the physical analyte manipulation strategy, mainly using super hydrophobic to further enhance uh, the Raman signals of the molecules that we would like to detect. Because the reason it is, is that a lot of the current hydro, uh, a lot of the cell substrates are hydrophilic in nature because nanoparticles are generally hydrophilic in nature. So that means when you put a droplet on the surface, it will cause random spreading of the liquid, uh, of the liquid itself. So this means that you are basically diluting the sample solution. You are reducing the number of molecule per surface area, meaning that you are reducing the surface intensity. So to overcome this problem, you can basically render the uh, surface say super hydrophobic if you have an aqueous uh, solution. So this will allow you to confine the droplet, physically confine the droplet into a much smaller area, therefore increase the number of molecule per surface area, and therefore increase the Raman intensity that you are measuring. Okay. So what we do in our group is that we fabricate our uh, source platform and render them super hydrophobic in nature. So the water repelling properties of the nanoparticles can come from the nanostructure surface roughness, which directly come from our nanoparticles, and followed by a uh, hydrophobic chemical coating. So this is uh, what we, how we do it. In this particular case, we use a binary silver nanocubes and silver nano, uh, nanooctahedral nanoparticles to make our source platform because they, they have very sharp edges and very uh, strong LSPR. So this will give rise to very strong surface enhancement. And also at the same time, provide the nanoscale roughness needed for the superhydrophobic surface. And after that, we will then coat another layer of the silver in order to like really weld the nanoparticles onto the surface uh, and to en enhance their mechanical stability on the surface. And finally, we coat them with the hydrophobic coating. So to result in this super hydrophobic uh, surge platform. So this is just to check and quantify, like, like I've been telling you like analyte concentration effect is good. Just how much analyte concentration can be result from such kind of super hydrophobic uh, confined strategy. So here's a comparison. We drop cast one microliter of say silica nanoparticle beads onto our super hydrophobic surface platform and onto a hydrophilic uh, a silicon substrate. So you can see upon drying, the, the analyte liquid is confined into 0.13 millimeter square of a surface area on our super hydrophobic surface platform. Whereas for the hydrophilic sil uh, silicon uh, substrate, the, the total area um, of the, uh, the analyte is 24 millimeter square. So this shows that having such kind of super hydrophobic surface platform can effectively confine and concentrate the liquid by 185 times. So not too bad, at least two orders of magnitude. So because of this strategy, we'll be able to get a very strong and reliable and most importantly, reproducible surface signals. Because one of the, 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 the challenge for SIRS is because of its hotspots, um, a lot of the area, a lot of the signals are not very uh, reproducible across the entire large area. If you want to make a sensor platform, the, the signal intensity uh, must be highly homogeneous across a large area. And by using our super, super hydrophobic strategy and in combination with our um, self-assembly method, we have successfully uh, fabricate this um, 
reliable source signals across our platform with standard deviation of less than 5%. And we are also at the same time uh, able to achieve detection limit of 10 to the minus 14 molar. And this is a comparison with a commercial um, uh, source substrate, which show very inhomogeneous source signals and very low detection limit. So now this is more on the fundamental on how we can make use of physical confined strategy to further increase the detection limit of our source platform beyond hotspot engineering. Now I'm going to discuss with you how we can make use of the previous strategy, the physical analyte strategy in combination with a chemical analyte strategy to detect miscarriage related metabolites in real urine samples for threatened miscarriage uh, detection. So just a little bit uh, background introduction on the urine metabolite. Uh, metabolites, as you know, are small molecules uh, generated by the, uh, by the human metabolism. So it can be, it, it is a frequently used as a direct, it can give rise to the direct functional readout of the physiological state of an organism. So increasingly, it is uh, for more frequently used as a biomarker for early disease detection therapeutic evaluation, and even for drugs te uh, drug tests. So the current gold standard for metabolite profiling is liquid chromatography mass spec because LCMS can provide, good, uh, provide molecular mass and with good detection sensitivity. And indeed, our collaborator in uh, our medical school uh, collect the urine sample, say from pregnant women with threatened miscarriage symptoms, and then use LCMS to identify and quantify a panel of metabolite families related to spontaneous miscarriage. Their studies show that in particular, two metabolite family, progesterone represented by pregnant molecule over here and cortisol um, a metabolite family represented by tetrahydrocortisol. These two molecules or these two uh, metabolite families have a direct and positive correlation to the miscarriage uh, to the uh, risk of misca miscarriage among pregnant women. So this is their, their benchmark that they found out using their, the, their LCMS study. So a little bit more introduction on the spontaneous miscarriage. Among all pregnant women during their first trimester, about 20% of the women will actually suffer what we call threatened miscarriage. So meaning that this woman will, have symptom, will experience symptoms such as vaginal bleeding, or abdominal pain. In fact, of all the threatened miscarriage, a quarter of the women will actually suffer uh, from the spontaneous miscarriage. And in fact, three quarters of them will proceed to have a healthy pregnancy and and give right uh, and, and 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 yeah and to have a healthy pregnancy. And uh, the problem is that currently there is no technology available to the clinicians to help them to rapidly satisfy patient on the spot. So this, as you can understand, expecting uh, uh, mothers uh, without knowing their risk of miscarriage while suffering the th uh, threatened miscarriage symptoms. So this will increase their psychological and physiological distress. So as you know, uh, in my previous slide, stress-induced tetrahydrocortisone metabolites is one of the factors contributing to the miscarriage. So this will become a vicious cycle. You increase their stress, you increase their stress-induced hormone, then you increase their, uh, their threatened miscarriage or their miscarriage risk. So we need a point of care diagnostic platform to guide the clinicians in predicting miscarriage risk among the patients. And just as we mentioned, LCMS is the gold standard, but LCMS is not a point of, uh, point of care detection tool due to its tedious and preparation and instrument is rather expensive and bulky. So as the SERS group, I would like to, of course, uh, introduce you SERS sensor as the next metabolomics uh, detection platform because SERS can produce molecular fingerprint spectrum and it is also a non-invasive test. It can provide results on the spot and instantly, and most importantly, it can detect trace molecule even at the PPM or the PPT level. And uh, Rama Reader is a much cheaper instrument as compared to LCMS. So we collaborate with the local hospital in Singapore to use our search platform 
and also chemo metrics to help rapidly identify pregnant women who are at very high risk of spontaneous miscarriage at the point of care. Our entire test can be done within 30 minutes. So we came up with three step strategy to achieve this. So first we designed a super hydrophobic uh, platform with both confined and capture strategy. So this will help us to further increase the sensitivity and the specificity of the signals that we obtain. Because remember, we have two target metabolites that we would like to identify and also quantify at the same time. And subsequently, when we put only 10 microliter of the uh, treated urine samples onto our SIRS substrate, we can then measure the multiplex SIRS intensity. So here are just some of the examples of the SIRS spectra that we can obtain from the urine samples. But these are complex urine samples. So our human eyes will not be able to easily identify the spectral changes, the minor intensity or the spectral shift uh, of all these samples. So we need chemometrics, uh, chemometrics model to help us to process large data sets and to build analytical uh, calibration, um, ca calibration graph and to help us to quickly quantify the multiplex metabolites present in patient samples. And finally, to help us categorize patients into the high miscarriage risk group and the healthy pregnancy group. So let me discuss a little bit more about our SERS platform strategy. So the first one I have introduced you before, basically we are using a, a physical confined, uh, confined strategy to physically physically confined our analyte into much smaller surface area as a way to increase the local detection concentration of our uh, target analyte and it therefore increasing the sensitivity for our SERS detection. So this is uh, something that I've discussed previously. And in the second step, we are using what we call a capture strategy, meaning that for on the of, the, of our nanoparticles, we decorate them with boronic acid. So which can form boronic ester bond with uh, the diol groups of both the target two of the target metabolites, pregnant and tetrahydrocortisone, like such as this one. So in this way, we can then really pull these target metabolites close to our surface in order to achieve maximum surge enhancement, especially in such a complex urine samples. So here are some of the example, uh, the sample spectra of the original boronic acid uh, spectrum. Boronic acid after interaction with uh, pregnant molecules, boronic acid after interaction with the tetrahydrocortisol uh, molecules. So this, uh, as a research group, we have done all of the uh, density function theory to make sure that indeed the spectral change that we observe here are due to the direct interaction of the boronic acid with pregnant and tetrahydrocortisone. But as a sensor, because we intend to make it a sensor, we need a much faster tool in order to, to help us to give, give rise to a result uh, instantly. So then we go to use a, a principal component analysis, which is basically an unsupervised machine learning tool to help us to cluster the spectra into their individual principal components. So here, once again, I show, uh, uh, so these three category of uh, a spectra, boronic acid, boronic acid with pregnant and boronic acid with tetrahydrocortisone. So by inputting, uh, by, by measuring uh, 25 spectra for each sample, total 75 spectra, you can see that PCA can successfully cluster them into the individual components over here. Now you may ask, what about other interfering molecules? Because for example, for a diabetic pregnant woman, uh, it is common to have, for example, fructose or glucose in their urine sample as well. So we did these control experiments by comparing against the, the SIRS, SIRS platform after interaction with the fructose, glucose, and compare with the one after interacting with the pregnant and the tetrahydrocortisone. Again, here you can see very clearly, once again, we will be able to clearly differentiate these spectra into their individual component with more than, uh, with 95% of the confi uh, confident, confidence level. 
indicating that our cell spectra are highly specific to their, the target molecules. So now you must be wondering, yeah, those are pure compound. Of course, it's easier, easier to detect and to differentiate. Now, what about the real patient samples? For that, we uh, did a case control study in collaboration with our KK Hospital, Women's and Children's Hospital here in Singapore. We collect 40, uh, we recruited 40 uh, patients uh, visiting the emergency department of the KK Hospital with uh, symptoms of a fractal miscarriage. We collect their urine sample and then we measure the cell spectra of the, these uh, urine samples, build a calibration graph and predict the percentage of pregnant in their, um, in their urine sample and then co compare our search data with the LCMS data and also with the actual pregnancy outcome to verify the consistency of our search measurements. Okay, but before we begin measure, measuring the actual pregnancy, uh, actual urine samples, we first built a calibration uh, graph. So this is how we measure. So we basically spiked pregnant and tetrahydrocortisone into the urine sample, and then we can build a calibration graph. So this is our calibration graph on the right. We have, we have obtained a very nice linear trend with R squared of 0 0.99, indicating that our calibration graph is very accurate. Now for the measurements of the real urine samples, for the 40 uh, patients, for each patient, we measure at least 20 cell spectra. So this is the representative cell spectra uh, from patient SH. This is the representative spectra from patient M30. So uh, we don't need to identify the individual peak change and et cetera. All we need to do is to uh, uh, input all this information, all this cell spectra into our partial least square two to help us to predict the percentage of the pregnant based on our calibration graph that I've shown you just now. So based on uh, our calibration graph and our cell spectra of the actual urine sample from the uh, actual, uh, uh, from these uh, uh, women with threatened miscarriage, uh, for example, for the case of SH, our, our cell uh, data indicate that this woman, her percentage of pregnant is 99.1%. And, and as compared to the LCMS data, uh, the difference is nearly 0.4% of a difference. For patient M30, our cell spectra indicate her percentage of pregnant is 96.9%, and the LCMS data indicate her percentage of pregnant is 96.7%, only 0.2% of a difference. So this shows that our cell data matches very well with the LCMS data. But the most important thing will be to compare the, actual, uh, the cell results with the actual pregnancy outcome. So based on this benchmark over here, uh, the one that we built, uh, my collaborator built using the LCMS data, their results show that if a percentage of pregnant is uh, lower than 97%, this pregnant woman will actually have a very high risk of miscarriage. And if the percentage of pregnant is higher than 98%, she will proceed to have a very stable pregnancy. So based on this benchmark, uh, we, uh, we come uh, to this conclusion. This group of uh, patients, they will have healthy pregnancy. And this group of patients, because their pregnant percentage is too low, lower than 97%, they will have a high risk of miscarriage. And this is the actual pregnancy outcome. Indeed, our cells prediction match very well with the actual pregnancy outcome in this case control study involving 40 uh, urine samples collected uh, from the uh, uh, um, from the women uh, visiting the the the, the emergency uh, emergency department of a hospital. So I think I went pretty fast. So um, I think just uh, finally. Um, I hope I have convinced you in uh, today's talk that uh, by combining uh, the cell spectrum, we will be able to combine both the hotspot engineering and physical and chemical analyte manipulation to achieve a non-invasive and multiplex detection 
of the actual uh, real urine sample and detect their metabolite um, um, concentration. And um, through this uh, project, what we learned is that in order for SIRS to move towards a medical diagnosis uh, application, chemometric uh, model or chemometric software or tool is very important because really we won't be able to differentiate these really minute differences, uh, minute spectral uh, changes or intensity changes uh, for the um, complex biological samples. And through this a combination of a SIR spectra, highly sensitive SIR, uh, uh, highly sensitive SIR sensor and the chemometric model, our group is able to achieve this ultra sensitive and rapid analysis of the of the uh, miscarriage related uh, metabolite uh, detection by using nearly 10 microliter of the urine sample. So finally, I would like to uh, thank my student uh, who did all the work. I, uh, so this work has been, uh, I believe 10 years uh, in building from the very fundamental in the early years of our group to finally, uh, uh, the ability to achieve uh, and detect uh, real urine samples. But this work is uh, pr uh, predominantly done by uh, this um, Ya Chen, uh, my uh, third or fourth year uh, PhD student. And of course, my collaborator at the hospital and our medical school, Andrew, uh, Tiam Chai and Chi Wai. And uh, most importantly, the funding agency uh, MOE, from MOE and uh, NRF. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for the exciting and stimulating talk. There are a lot of questions, so we'll and we have plenty of time to for discussion. So, so thank you, uh, thank you for that. Um, I guess one of the first questions is related to um, real samples, mm -hmm. so based on patient samples. So, are there any um, pre-processing, any uh, that need that needs to be done before they work on your superhydrophobic surface substrates? Yes, definitely, because uh, the first thing we learned is that uh, urine sample has a lot of urea. So we need to desort all these uh, salt uh, in, the, in the sample because uh, we measure in the dry condition. So if we did not do any pretreatment or desorting, we will have a lot of uh, salt on the surface, then we won't be able to measure uh, well. So definitely pretreatment. So this is also the reason why, uh, so, sorry, I didn't, go into the detail of the pretreatment. Uh, so the majority of the 30 minutes uh, sample measurement time actually um, goes to the pretreatment. We need to desalt, we need to get rid of uh, some of the protein as well. So these are the two major um, processes that we need to take care of before we can really measure the small metabolite molecules. Mm. Great, and just a follow-up question to that. Are you able to use other types of bodily fluids to detect biomarkers, for example, blood or exhaled breath that can condense on your on your surface? Yeah, so, so uh, definitely uh, for, well, uh, it's like what my medical school uh, collaborator said, it depends on how clean your samples are. So if you have uh, blood samples, uh, yeah, definitely is going to be more complicated. You will need to spend more time and more processes to pre-treat the sample that get rid of the plasma or, or uh, red blood cell or whatever. Uh, whereas I would say uh, um, body, body fluid like uh, maybe tears or maybe uh, bone marrow liquid will be cleaner in a sense or even human breath will be cleaner in a sense. So it really depends on um, which body fluid you are targeting. And in fact, there are many studies, uh, getting more and more studies uh, to use breath uh, for search detection as well. I think these will be very promising because they are really cleaner, easier to work with. Thank you. Um, in complex medical samples, is it possible mm. that some other compounds can interact with MB, MP, MPBA modes and interfere yeah. with the uh, uh, THC and pregnant interactions? Yeah, so um, 
Yes, it is possible that uh, other um, molecule, uh, molecules with dio functional groups will then interact with your uh, boronic acid to form the boronic acid bond. But again, uh, but this molecule itself, uh, the one that will interact or interfere, they too will have their uh, molecular fingerprint, their Raman cross section. So you will be able to pick up the Raman, cross, uh, Raman fingerprint from this spectra and then uh, do differentiate. So this is also the reason why when we did the control experiment involving the, wait, let me pull out that slide, involving the fructose and the glu glucose, and we are still able to differentiate them quite easily. As you can see, let me sh show you this slide. So this is a control experiment that we did uh, by adding the fructose and the glucose into the PCA. And you can see, so this is the cluster that belongs to the spectra of the uh, boronic acid after interaction with fructose. This is the cluster of the boronic acid interaction with the glucose. And they are in different cluster as compared to the tetrahydrocortisone and compared to the pregnant. Yeah. Um, is, what is the, there are a couple of questions related to the sensitivity Mm -hmm. of uh, of this uh, of your approach related to uh, are there a minimum number of concentration of molecules yeah and um, and as you have to pretreat the, the the urine samples do you lose significant amounts of, of metabolites in that way as well so both I think related to concentration mm -hmm. okay so for example the 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 actual pregnant and the tetrahydrocortisone concentration uh, that we that uh, we use and we found out is in the nanomolar uh, regime. So the calibration curve that we built uh, in these slides, in this slide, wait, let me show you. Yeah, so it's in the range of nanomolar concentration. So by combine, so that's why I feel it is very important not to depend on the hotspot engineering alone, but really by combining these uh, super hydrophobic uh, um, properties to physically confine the analyte and by the chemical analyte uh, capturing, uh, yeah, we will be able to achieve. That's why I, I feel that this is the whole reason why we are able to, to detect these small molecules at such, at such low concentration, despite them not having any special affinity. So because you can make use of the capturing agent in, this, in our case, is the boron acid and using the super hydrophobic properties of the molecules to further enhance the sensitivity and the detection limit that we can achieve. So I feel like uh, this is the this is very critical moving forward, at, at, at least for, for my group. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Jia Xing? Hi, Hi Jia Xing. Hi, Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> Hi, um, great to see you too. It's it's really amazing that you're able to apply, you know, what you do in the lab. I think you know, up to maybe about ten years ago, and finally try to solve a new problem. So this is really yeah. exciting. And I also read uh, on social media that you're recently applying SIRS, try to uh, address some of the testing issues in COVID. Yeah. In COVID pandemic. Right? So I just want to ask, like, maybe on behalf of all the students, maybe a, a general uh, higher level question. So do you think the, uh, where the next problem is going to be if you want to use SIRS to, uh, let's say, to, to solve a real detection problem? Do you think there's still any unsolved uh, problems in SIRS itself? Or is SIRS pretty much OK, done, mature, but you really need to worry about the interface between SIRS? Uh, I mean, the interface between the sense platform and the real samples, I think you mentioned some of those, like uh, mm -hmm. how clean the sample is, maybe add a filter or concentrator. So where the problems are, if a new student wants to get into this, try to improve the search platform even more, or try to come up with a better, maybe, interface. Um, I, thanks, Jesse. <laughs> this is a very deep question. <laughs> I've been thinking for this for the past 10 years. So when I first started uh, as a tenure track uh, assistant professor back in uh, Singapore, um, the first thing that we would like to, uh, to um, tackle as a group is to really achieve a homogeneous sensing platform. Because I, I believe if you were to really use it for sensing application, at least the signal must be homogeneous. Um, yeah, so, so that's why I think in terms of 
how you can produce large quantity of uh, nanoparticles uh, and then uh, homogeneously uh, coat them onto a substrate. That will be an important um, thing to, to tackle. I, I believe we more or less um, resolve this issue and we have seen uh, many groups are uh, able to achieve very highly homogeneous uh, surf sensing platform for various uh, sensing application as well. And more lately, indeed, I think the interface will be very critical. Um, yeah, th the problem for SIRS is that really is surface sensitive. If the molecules don't come to the surface, you get nothing, you get zero signals. So uh, in, I would say in this case then, interface strategy, interface strategy will be very important. And uh, uh, at least from, from my experience that, um, yeah, we uh, increasingly, uh, I'm working with uh, the doctors uh, from the medical school or the doctors from the hospital or even, yeah, so, their molecules have no affinity, they are not thiolated, so they don't come, they, they, they will not stick onto the surface. So yeah, we need, as a chemist, we need to find a, a proper chemical interaction so that you can really trap the molecule close to the surface. So this is, I think, right now, mostly my, my, our job as a chemist right now. And, and, and what something that we learned uh, through this project, in fact, this is our very first chemometric related work, is that uh, bio, bio, bio statistics or biometrics, uh, is it called? Bio, bi yeah, it's been there for many years, for decades. And uh, why not use this chemometric tool to further enhance our um, detection for, the, for, for our sensor? So I think the, this question, like I said, is multiple fold. And yeah, we, we need to tackle from multiple fronts. Okay. Yes, so, so there's no one yeah. simple answer to that, yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's again, just really amazing that um, you are using this to solve real problems. And uh, that's very brave. Uh, next time when I see you, uh, I hope you uh, bring a little device with you and I'll be your lab rat. <laughs> I can be a test samples at least to see if I, I have so that too. Breath, okay? <laughs> I hope so too. It's a little bit premature uh, to discuss our breathalyzer project. Uh, yeah, because uh, we are still f trying to find out like why is, because uh, what Jiaxing mentioned is that lately we are using our SERS platform for uh, using, uh, for as a breathalyzer for COVID-19 detection, because we believe um, a human breath can be used for COVID-19 detection because uh, the virus will attack your lung and then this will change your metabolism pathway and hence your breath-based metabolite distribution. So in fact, breath, like I mentioned just now, breath is a very excellent uh, body fluid for COVID-19 detection. So uh, yeah, but we are still trying to find out like how we can achieve this sensitivity and the scientific part of the spectra, we haven't totally figured out yet. Uh, my students are working hard to take it. And so hopefully we will be able to share with you the next time we meet, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just a couple more questions. Um, so you had mentioned that you can discriminate among at least four or five different types of, of molecules based on the mm -hmm. uh, on these plots. Um, is there an upper limit to that based on mm -hmm. your experience? Uh, we are not sure yet. So far, the record is about 16 different molecules. Uh, yeah, because uh, like I said, when you have a capturing agent and then you have a different target analyte, what we are obtaining is no longer the pure analyte or the pure capturing agent alone. Rather, I believe is a highly specific probe analyte uh, spectrum. So through this highly specific uh, um, probe uh, capturing agent and the light uh, spectrum, again, you have achieved a different kind of uh, fingerprint uh, specificity. So, uh, so far we have tried 16. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, hopefully someone will give me another um, problem that uh, then that will force us to push our limits. Uh, yeah, we don't know yet. Hmm. Um, are you able to use uh, your technique for larger molecules 
more biological molecules such as DNA or, or, or proteins, or does it really work best mm. for some of these small molecules? Um, I, I, I know there are many groups that work on using SIRS for DNA detection and for protein detection. So uh, it's just that uh, our group, before this project, we were really very fundamental working on the dye molecule detection and all the stuff. So uh, this metabolites is our very first um, um, bio-related uh, project. Yeah, but uh, like I said, there are many reports on the DNA detection using SIRS, the, the protein detection using SIRS. I don't see any reason why, why not? Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Well, thank you for answering all of our questions and for delivering a fantastic talk and, and, and joining us late your time, early our, relatively early our time. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Terry, thanks.